Hi, and welcome to Sharp's Chat with famed director and cinematographer Wally Pfister. I'm Jonathan Strickland, senior writer at HowStuffWorks.com, and Mr. Pfister. Call me Wally. All right. <laughs> it's a big Please. thrill for me. Uh, Wally is, has got a, an incredible resume. He uh, directed his first feature film in 2014, Transcendence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's been cinematographer on some phenomenal films, The Dark Knight, Memento, The Italian Job. You won an Oscar for Inception, mm -hmm. uh, The Prestige, which has some of my favorite shots in film of all time, oh, wow. which I'll probably talk about at That's some cool. point. Yeah. And we wanted to talk about resolution and how it's important in storytelling as well as experiencing storytelling, mm -hmm. hearing stories told to you. and how it makes an impact and, and how it's a tool for artists like yourself mm -hmm. to get your stories across. So first question is why is high resolution viewing so important to the work you produce and the viewers who get to experience it? Well again we've always tried to capture the images in the highest possible resolution to have that as as our tool. You can always down, downgrade an image and mm -hmm. if you want it to look grittier, grainier, uh, you know, uh, out of focus, you can always do that after the fact or you can, you can have it. But to, but to be able to, to, to capture something in the highest resolution and display it in the highest re resolution, you have to have the tools available to do so. And then it's a matter of, you know, how, how important is that? And I think the more you can create an immersive experience for an audience, mm -hmm. um, the, the better uh, they'll enjoy the storytelling. And I think it's a big part of the storytelling. So to see technology constantly improving um, means that we have a greater range of tools for our, our visual storytelling, uh, uh, you know, out of our toolbox, mm -hmm. if you will. Sure. And how do you feel like the ability to capture that detail, the ability to display that detail mm -hmm. means you've got a much more versatile spectrum to work from. You know, you're mm -hmm. not limited at all in that sense. So mm -hmm. you can play with things like light and shadow. Mm -hmm. And those are really important elements as far as being a storyteller too, aren't they? They are. This, these, you know, things that one might think are, are uh, you know, uh, beyond what an audience cares about or beyond what an audience can see, it's really, really not true. I, mm -hmm. You know, um, we can play with the subtleties of, of the visual aspect of a narrative in the shadow detail. How much do you want to show an audience in that shadow detail um, in the highlights in terms of how much is, is, is overexposed and blown out or how much detail is in there. It's, it, it's all part of, you know, a director and a cinematographer's, you know, again, toolbox mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of storytelling. So uh, I don't want to under, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't want audiences to, to, to not understand how important uh, that increase in quality is to, to the experience that they're having. Sure. And when you sit, you know, uh, five or six feet away from one of these screens and now you don't see pixels at all anymore. You right. don't see the rectangles and the, uh, 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 and the different shapes that, that form that image. Mm -hmm. um, then there's not a distraction to the image. And that's another important thing. So you actually get to experience the, the way you intended when you were making mm -hmm. it. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the point. We've we've always shot in, in you know the highest resolution. When I was working with uh, Chris Nolan, we shot in anamorphic 35 millimeter, mm -hmm. shot in IMAX 65 millimeter, um, and uh, IMAX 65 millimeter is resolution that's over 16K. So it's wow. incredible, amount. and 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 we're able we were able to prove. That audiences did care about that, mm -hmm. you know. When the Dark Knight came out, audiences, uh, you know, saw it in, in in great numbers in the IMAX theaters to be able to have that immersive experience. So, in 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 taking this into the home with, you know, uh, televisions like Sharp is producing now, it's it's an enormous leap in that immersive experience in the home. Sure. Um, and and as uh, as we now have. Uh, 4K in, in, in Sharp's you know, UHD technology and then heading towards 8K, mm -hmm. it's an extraordinary experience being close to a television with that kind of image on it. Well, and, and I find I get a real emotional attachment to movies. I, I mm -hmm. get emotionally invested and I find having that level of detail and experiencing the story that way mm -hmm. 
really does have an impact. It does it does mean something. Yeah. It's not just, oh, it looks prettier. Yeah. It has meaning to it. Mm -hmm. There are moments, the prestige, there's a moment with light bulbs that yeah. happens That's that right. fills the viewer with awe. Yeah. Yeah. And you need that detail to yeah. have that. You do need that detail. In, in, in particular, that sequence, which is a high crane shot of uh, uh, um, I, I, Hugh Jackman out in a field of, of, of these light bulbs, the light bulbs go from being, they dim up slowly. Mm -hmm. So once they reach that high level of exposure, to be able to see the detail in those bulbs, you need that kind of range. And at the time, you know, 35 millimeter anamorphic film was the best way to capture that detail. And then again, if you're then showing that on a, a television screen, uh, it, let's say for instance, you scan that film in a 4K, which the studios are doing with all their material now anyway. So the content is being created in 4K. Mm -hmm. You scan it in a 4K, and then you're able to, to output it, uh, uh, you know, on an HD monitor, you're not going to get everything that's there. Mm -hmm. If you take a 4K uh, transfer of that film and see it on a, on a 4K monitor, suddenly then you're, you're getting more of what we captured and on a film that we shot eight years ago. So to, to, for me, it's incredibly exciting to, to take a film like Prestige that has, also has firelight and, and a lot of shadow detail because the, the film takes place in the turn of the century, mm -hmm. um, to be able to, to see that film eight years later on a, on a screen at home and have more detail and clarity than when it was orig originally created, uh, uh, what you saw in the home, mm -hmm. is, is extraordinary. And that's the kind of improvement in technology that's essential. Um, I think, for, for those of us who care about it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a gasp-worthy mm. moment. Yeah. And then you can actually elicit that response yeah. that was intended. Absolutely. Well, that's fantastic. And I, I do think audiences care about it as well. That's, that's the other thing. I think, I think uh, lay people, you know, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker and I'm a cinematographer and care greatly about the image quality, but I, I firmly believe that audiences feel uh, the same way when they're, when they're experiencing it. That's absolutely true. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not a filmmaker and I yeah. completely agree. Uh, so what new skills have cinematographers, directors, and directors of photography needed to develop to take advantage of the technological advancements that we've seen over the last few years? Well, again, in this increase in, in resolution mm -hmm. and, uh, um, you know, clarity and, uh, and contrast and color, you know, uh, separation, um, I think it's really raised the bar for all departments involved in the visual aspect of storytelling. So whether you're a costumer, um, uh, a wardrobe stylist, or, or a production designer, or, or a cinematographer, the detail is now in that image, so you have to pay closer attention. Something that you might not have seen in the, in the shadows, you know, in, in, in lesser technology, or in, in the sharpness of it, scenic painting, for instance, mm -hmm that you might not have noticed how, you know, the quality level of that painting, you really do notice it. And if you're doing aging or something like that, you really do notice those details and it's, it puts more scrutiny on it. It's a, it's a magnifying glass on that. So they, all those departments have to pay a little more attention and, and put a little more care into the image. So it's across the board that the care is being put into the image. It's, you know, for instance, if a production designer is putting that care into how he, you know, paints the walls on a set, Cinematographer is then putting that care into how it's uh, being lit and photographed, and mm -hmm. companies like Sharp are putting that care into the products that they're displaying this material on. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I remember seeing older costumes and props at, at various museum displays, and it's it's kind of eye-opening when you see those that were made in classic films, and you think about how amazing it looked on the on the screen, and then mm -hmm. you look at the detail that actually existed in the yeah, real things. And you right. think, how did, how did that happen? Yeah. Uh, and now with these high resolutions, we've got this level of artistry that's coming in through every avenue yeah. into the film industry, yeah, that's true. which is, uh, I mean, it, it, it's great for film lovers who get mm -hmm. to see this, this amazing amount of detail. Mm -hmm. um, so from your experience, how have others involved in the filmmaking process uh, adapted beyond beyond this like uh, are we even seeing this with uh, acting choices or with makeup hmm. on top of on top of things like 
costume. I think props. absolutely with makeup you have to play close attention. Yeah. If, if nothing else, you have to make sure it's not looking like makeup. Because as soon as you start covering things up, of course you're seeing more detail, so actors are not going to want to see <laughs> right. the age the age come out. <laughs> and so, but you can also see pancake makeup on people sometimes. So again, it's it's much more care has to has to go into that. In terms of performance, I certain think you know actors will be aware mm -hmm. uh, of the fact that their image is going to be larger and in, and and again, you know, getting great value out of being close to a screen like this and as they get larger you know obviously the distance is increased but you'll see this incredible detail that is scrutinizing you sure. know the performance in a close-up on an actor's face <laughs> something that I don't think a lot of people had taken into account when they first started <laughs> probably right? yeah 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 <laughs> so a little peek behind the the scenes when you're in your filmmaking mode what mm. types of displays do you view your films on before finalizing a film and how does high resolution filmmaking affect the new ways that viewers are consuming this content on other types of devices like tablets and things like that right well well the gold standard is still projected film mm -hmm. and and sadly it doesn't really exist in in movie theaters anymore mm -hmm. it's going away and it's going away quickly so again what what uh, i've always tried to do is is you know uh, is, is is fight for any digital technology to to try to to be as good as film or or you know exceed film eventually it hasn't gotten there yet but now we're we're heading towards some incredible new technology that's going to go into theaters with laser projection and again that's starting to catch up mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's the way you want to see material now I, the, my film was shot on film and and I did the color timing on film because again that's the highest resolution there's no degradation there's no scan that's going to down res it and if you're looking at 35 millimeter anamorphic film with you know a resolution upwards of 8k then there there is no way to scan it and 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 show it digitally uh, as good as film however the realities are we're we're dealing with with uh, with you know uh, digital technology in theaters um, and as I said, that's the so you want to see it in its best form. Mm -hmm. Following that, though, uh, you know we do our, our color work for for um, uh, for video. Uh, believe it or not, on plasmas, mm. um, and still a, a high definition plasma is right now the standard. But to see those go to 2K and 4K, and then to see the LED technology mm -hmm. catch up with with where plasma was a few years ago. Because um, plasma is not a very, it's not a viable technology. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not very cost effective. It draws way too much power. Um, and we're getting beautiful image quality now with, with LEDs. Um, so that we'll, we'll see how that'll start to, to change in the future. But to be able to do color timing for video release on 4K is, is really going to be exciting as well. Cool. And have you ever actually watched one of your films on a 4K I TV? Haven't. You I have not. Yet. No, oh, we have a treat for you. At some yes. Point. So uh, I really would be curious. I'll have to have a follow up at some point. I'll just call you up and see how you liked yeah, it. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Glad we have that. So it's going to happen now. Uh, so now, do you feel like the industry is adapting to 4K or greater viewing resolutions? Is 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 there actual talk of this? In the the industry? industry is, and the in, the industry is probably uh, you know far in in front of the consumers in terms of understanding this kind of resolution. Because again, we've had the film as the gold standard, and and that's that's been um, what all the digital capture technology has been trying to emulate and mm -hmm. catch up with. Um, and so you've got, you know, uh, companies like uh, um, uh, uh, Airy and, and Red creating these high resolution, you know, image capture systems for the professional market. Um, and, and these cameras are looking, uh, you know, better and better every day. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of setting the bar in capture. And, and then it really is a matter of how it's displayed in the theater. And again, there are 4K projectors, you know, in, a, in, a, in most theaters. And now they're head, heading upwards of laser projectors. I would rather not see 2K projectors in theaters anymore. Because <laughs> again, you know, to, to pay to go to a movie theater and see a you know, 2K projection is not doing the image justice in the way it's being captured now. Right. Um, yeah, I can totally see that. So, and moving on to the to the home theater, obviously you want to have the 
the greatest ability to again see that that mm -hmm. vision yeah. as it was intended. Absolutely. Um, I mean, every time I, I sit down to watch a film, I want as good an experience as possible so mm -hmm. that I can have the reactions that the filmmakers intended me to have mm -hmm. as opposed to just be wondering, well, I wonder what that fuzzy shape was supposed to be. <laughs> That's right. Unless, That's of right. course, that was the filmmaker's intent, which it could be. But. That's right. That's right. But again, we want to be able to have the tools to both capture those images and display them in the highest quality and then you know, let us make the choice whether we're going to degrade it. Right, not. right, as opposed to the choice being made for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I don't know about you, but, you know, I also, I can't watch standard def anymore. Yeah. I have just a hard time watching standard def. It just yeah. looks, you know, it, it, not just, you know, inferior, mm -hmm. but it just, it just looks like you're watching, you know, I don't know. It looks like, uh, 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 but... So uh, perhaps, you know, that'll be the case very soon between high def and, and 4K. Well, sure. You I may mean, not, you know, think you care about it right now, but once you start to get used to, to that image, you, you'll, you won't want to go back and look at anything in high def. And, and we're seeing the general consumer be able to get access mm -hmm. to these higher resolution capturing mm -hmm. cameras. I yeah. mean, things, you know, whether it, it's... Uh, a 2K or 4K camera, mm -hmm. and so the whole standard is rising. Not just, mm -hmm. not just the actual films that filmmakers are creating, but people like me who want to shoot a video. We, we have access to incredible technology mm -hmm. today, yeah. and to take advantage of that, we need to be able to, to have a gorgeous display to Absolutely. actually see it on. Absolutely. Um, so, what do you think does the near future hold for us when it comes to availability and high resolution content? Aha. Uh -huh. um, content, it, it's really difficult for me to speak to because I'm, I'm, all I'm aware of is what I've learned at CES, <laughs> which is Fair. that Netflix is, is going to be you know, mm -hmm. uh, streaming a show in, in 4K, mm -hmm. which I think is in, incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what something looks like in that um, and uh, and I, 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 I don't know where they are with ultra high definition uh, you know players and, and mm -hmm. what's what's mm -hmm. coming out for the home and whether that will up or whether it'll all be streaming I don't know if we're leaping over the player and if that that's going to be a thing of the past I'm sure somebody in this room probably knows better than oh you know well, well you got in <laughs> well no th this is the thing is that we're seeing broadband penetration reach an all-time high we're seeing incredible players go into the field to offer up huge pipelines of data that ah. we never had access to before because yes, yes. you know back in the days of old dial-up modems and things right. you couldn't imagine ever yeah. seeing oh, absolutely. a yeah. photograph let alone that's a film. right it's true yeah so but we're now in this mm. era where this stream technology is possible. YouTube yeah. is also looking at doing 4K streaming well, that as well. Would, all that would be incredible. Um, uh, and, and I would just hope that, that the bandwidth is wide enough to, to minimize compression. Yes. Because what I, what I really feel is the best use of, of, of these fantastic 4K uh, uh, screens uh, is is with as close to an uncompressed image as you can get, and and, and you know so we're not seeing any of those anomalies to do that screen justice. Well, I have a few questions here sent in by fans okay. who wanted to know since they heard I had the opportunity to speak with you. Mm -hmm. uh, one fan question was, "What got you started in your career?" Wow. Um, I mean, I got started as a as a as a kid, you know, as a fan. Um, I watched movies a lot as a kid, and then I, I managed to get my hands on a Super 8 camera, mm -hmm. and we made Super 8 films. And that was a fascinating process at the time because you'd you'd have a cartridge of Super 8 film that was three had three minutes, mm -hmm. uh, three minute capacity. Pop it into your Super 8 camera, shoot, you know, that that roll of film. You'd put it in a envelope and send it to Rochester, to Kodak in Rochester, they'd process it and send you back that real film. And when you got that real film back at the, in my case, at the local drugstore, mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty exciting yeah. to, to put that up and, and to see the images you got. So, so that's, that was the beginning of my fascination with filmmaking and, mm -hmm. and with images. And, and I, I uh, right out of high school, pursued you know, career and got a job as a production assistant at a television station. Um, and then I became a news cameraman and did that for a while and 
did documentaries for a while. And then I had a point in my career where, where I just said, you know, I want to go to Hollywood. I want to make take a shot of it. So left everything behind that world and moved out to Hollywood and tried to try to make it happen. It seems to have worked out for you. Worked out all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what would you consider your most challenging task while filming? It's interesting because it depends on what the job is, uh -huh. you know. As a director, the, your your most challenging task is multitasking, <laughs> is 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 having your hand in everything that's going on and communicating with every individual department head and, and making sure you're able to put focus on what that uh, department is doing and make sure that that's serving what your vision is for the film. Mm -hmm. You know, as a, as a cinematographer, um, it it's about again, it's it's about management and keeping a clear head. Um, in, in managing uh, all the folks that are working for you to make sure you're, you're, uh, um, you're doing your, your homework. But I wouldn't call any of these tasks anyway. They're all disciplines. Mm -hmm. And if you discipline yourself, then you're going to be doing the best work. So know what you're doing the night before. Yeah. <laughs> be prepared for it. Show up to work sober. <laughs> <laughs> good, good text. Yeah, yeah, that's good. It yeah. took me a while to figure out that one. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but and, and, uh, and be prepared. Excellent. Yeah, I imagine it must be very different to be a cinematographer and you're, you're trying your best to make certain that the, the vision the director had is the one that gets realized. And then mm -hmm. being a director and delegating that to a cinematographer, yeah. that's got to yeah. be a really interesting moment. Yeah, it, it is. And, and you don't completely detach yourself from it. I mean, part of a director's job is, is the visual storytelling mm -hmm. as well. So it is part of, part of that, that job. But... Um, uh, but you have to you have to respect and uh, um, and use wisely the wisdom of your your collaborators. And if you hire a great cinematographer, you better listen to what he has to say. And if you hire <laughs> great production designers, same thing applies. Mm -hmm. And same thing with with hiring great actors. You know, you, you're not you're doing yourself as a director. You're doing yourself a disservice if you don't listen to the, to the voices of the collaborators around you. Excellent. Well, our next fan question is, how hard is it to express your own ideas within the industry? That's an interesting question. I, I think that the, the, the great way to express your own ideas is, uh, is in independent filmmaking mm. still. If you, if you really have a, a unique and original idea um, in independent filmmaking, you can, you can execute that idea. Whereas within the studio system, you have, there has to be something in place where, where it needs to make money. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that's, and that's where you know, it has to fit then into you know, a, a set of rules and, um, and a set of rules have to apply. Mm -hmm. um, in general, you know, uh, people like, uh, Chris Nolan are amazing at, at telling unique original stories in a way that, that are very profitable. So there are a handful of great filmmakers that, that can accomplish both. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I think that if you really have something unique and original and it might not necessarily be um, commercial, then independent film is still a great way to go. Excellent. And we have one more here. Uh, will you be directing any other films like Transcendence? I'll be directing something else. I don't know whether I'll venture into to science fiction again, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, it remains to be seen. But for me, it's just about you know finding a, a, a an interesting story and telling an interesting story. And I think it can be in any genre. In any, uh, in any genre, it can yeah. be science fiction, or it can be, you know, just straight dialogue on the screen. Who knows? You know? Excellent. Or even documentary. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one last one. This is from a, a John Strickland. Uh, how heavy <laughs> is an Oscar? <laughs> an Oscar, I'm, I'm told, is eight pounds. Okay. I never weighed it myself. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have one, and it feels like you're holding a newborn baby, basically. It's a similar weight. Excellent. But, but, but as I said, it, it pretty much everybody says the same thing when they pick it up. <laughs> oh, it's heavy. <laughs> so that's, that's, I'm sure, what I said you know, when, I, when I picked it up, when, when it was handed to me. And I think that's, that's I have, the general consensus. Okay. It's heavier than you think it is. Every time I look at it, I just think, oh, that looks heavy. But that's, that's as close <laughs> as I can go. get. There you go. Well, Wally, thank you so much you, for Jonathan. joining us for this My conversation. Pleasure. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you, Sharp, for allowing me to have this conversation. <laughs> and not to mention, be able to look at these amazing displays and really see how this technology is allowing us to mm. experience these stories the way 
filmmakers like you intended. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thrilled with what, what Sharp's doing, what they've shown me here. It's pretty incredible stuff. Well, that wraps this up. Thank you so much. Thank I you, appreciate John. it. Appreciate it. Thanks.